It is impossible to do justice to the biography of the Prophet without shedding some light on his greatest companions, those companions who were so close to his heart and those who really sacrificed in the way of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and they remained true to the message of the Prophet and they did not disobey the Prophet in his lifetime and also after he passed away. One of those companions that I would like to shed some light on is Salman al-Muhammadi or also known as Salman al-Farisi who came from Persian origins. Salman came to Medina according to historical reports the first year of the Hijrah. In the first year of the Hijrah when the Prophet settled in Medina because we're still examining the events of the first year it's now appropriate to talk about Salman and how he came to the religion of Islam. He is by far one of the best, if not the absolute best companion of the Holy Prophet Let's examine the biography of Salman and see how he found his path to the Prophet Salman comes from Persian origins, he comes from the area in modern day Iran around the city of Isfahan. Historically this was called Isbahan, he comes from that area. His name was Ruzbih, some narrations also state he had another name or title by the name of Mahu. The Prophet is the one who gave him the name Salman, originally his name was not Salman, he had a Persian name Ruzbih, the Prophet gave him the word the name Salman. What does the word Salman mean? Comes from which word? Salman comes from which word? Salman. The name of our religion, Islam. Islam. It comes from Taslim, it comes from submitting to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Salman is the one who greatly submits to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So that is the, need, the, the meaning of his name, the one who fully submits, the Mustaslim. The Mustaslim in Arabic, we call them Salman. There is another meaning to the word Salman. It also means the one who's Salim. In Arabic, what's Salim? Okay, Qalb Salim. What does that mean? What's the translation of Salim? Salim, Salim. Free from any deficiencies, right? If you buy a product and you are asked, is this a deficient product? Or it's a Salim product, you say no it's a Salim product, Salim, Salim, it's sound, exactly, sound heart. So the, the second meaning of Salman is the one who's sound, the one who does not have deficiencies, the one who's free from any deficiencies. So this is a beautiful name that the Holy Prophet gave to Salman. His father's name was Khashfudan, it's a Persian name. He was a village leader in Persia in, in and around the city of Isfahan and he was a very well-known Zoroastrian figure in Persia, his father. He was a leading uh, tribal leader in that area. His father was very wealthy, he had a lot of lands, farmlands and he loved his son Salman or at the time his name was Ruzbe and he treated him in a very very special way. His father loved Salman so much, such that he actually was so protective of him, he kept him in the house. He would not really allow him to go around and travel and leave the house too often because he loved him so much. And Salman actually became a very devout Majusi. <coughs> Majus was the dominant religion in Persia before Islam. They basically worshipped fire or they worshipped the sun or anything that has fire and Salman by being kept in the house of his father he was being trained to take care of a Majusi temple that housed a fire and they would worship it because they would worship fires you know in their temples 
But Salman had doubts about this religion. From the outside, he did look like a Majusi Zoroastrian, but really in his heart and mind, he did not believe that fire was divine and you worship the fire. He did really have these doubts. He thought to himself, fire is something we human beings make and in fact we have to protect the fire in our temples. How can it be God or divine or godly? It's impossible. So he did really have those doubts in mind. Therefore, the ahadith indicate he was always a muwahid. He truly believed in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and he never committed shirk in his belief system. In one hadith, the Prophet ﷺ was sitting with Salman. This hadith is narrated by Al Asbagh ibn Nabata from Imam Ali. ﷺ. He says the Prophet was sitting and Salman was sitting next to him. A Bedouin, a Arabi man, comes in and he pushes Salman away. He like pushes him to the side and he takes a seat. The Prophet ﷺ becomes furious. He becomes very disappointed and he tells that man, you know, with, with some anger, he tells him, Ya A'rabi, atunahi rajulan yuhibbuhu Allahu tabaraka wa ta'ala. How are you pushing away a man loved by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? Fissama, Allah loves them in the heavens. Wa yuhibbuhu rasuluhu fil ard. And his prophet loves him on earth. Inna Salman ma kana majusiyan. Salman was never a Majusi. Maybe from the outside you would see him, he's worshipping the fire like the Majusis would, but inside his heart he was always faithful, he had Iman. So this is a shahada, a testimony from the Prophet that Salman was really never a Majusi. One day Salman leaves and he wants to travel. So he travels to a village when he passes by a church. This is in Iran. Well, at the time it wasn't called Iran, Persia. He was impressed, impressed by their way of worship. These Christians, they have this act of worship and these belief systems. He was really, really impressed by that. And he figured, he told them, look, your religion is better than my religion. That worship is fire. He asked them, where is the cradle for Christianity? Where? is the origin of Christianity. They told him it's in Bilad al-Sham, the Levant, the Palestine Syrian era. If you really want the cradle of Christianity, go there. <coughs> so he tells his father about being impressed by Christianity. His father becomes very disturbed. He told him you have to be a Majusi and you have to stay on the religion of your forefathers. You don't have the right to go and become a Christian. He really threatens him. So fearing that his son would convert to Christianity, he actually grounds him at home, he keeps him at home. But Salman found ways to send them messages, like if there were people who would be passing by, travelers, he would communicate with that church, asking them about the religion and then he told them once, if you ever have a traveler from this Isfahan area going to Sham, let me know, send me a message and I'm going to flee and escape. So they give him a message that there's a group of people on a caravan going to Sham and they're in the Isfahan area. So he secretly leaves his father's house, he joins them on their caravan and he goes to Sham. So he actually fled his father. When he gets to Sham, he meets a very well-known bishop over there, Uskof in Arabic. He serves him, he learns Christianity from him, but he realized that this bishop was too corrupt. He would command the people to pay charity and people will bring their sadaqat and charity to the church and then he realized secretly this bishop would steal that money, that charity, he would not allow it to go to the poor, to charitable projects, he would spend it on himself. So he started loathing him. So when the bishop died and they were about to give him the funeral services, Salman, he couldn't keep silent anymore. He meets the Christian community, he's like, look, I've been serving this bishop for a while now. This guy's evil. They're like, why? How dare you say that? He's like, all those charity that you would bring, he would use, he would actually store it for himself. They're like, what's your evidence? He's like, I'll show you. I'll show you where he would bury the treasures and all those gold and silver. I'll show you. 
and he showed them and there, they found that same charity that was being given to the church was being confiscated by this bishop. So the hadith indicates that they abandoned him, they, not, they did not even observe the funeral rites on that bishop. Another bishop was installed in his place. Salman says this time this bishop was honest. He was a true Christian. He was honest, he was uh, always humble, he worshipped God properly, he never confiscated any money, he never embezzled any money. So it's like I really loved him and I really started to love Christianity. But then after a while of Salman serving this new bishop, the bishop gets sick and he is about to die. So Salman tells him, what should I do after you? Who is a good Christian scholar that I can go to? Refer me to someone, don't just leave me like that. That bishop tells him, look in this Palestine, Sham, Syrian region, honestly I don't trust anybody. But if you want someone, who's really, really trustworthy, then you go to a man in Mosul, northern Iraq today. There is a man there, he gives him the details of that man, trust him with your religion, he's a very good man. So Salman in his search for the truth, he leaves Sham and he goes to Mosul, he finds that man. He learns from that man, he serves that man and he's building on his knowledge and his faith in God. That man becomes sick and he's about to die. Salman asks him the same question, okay you're leaving, who do you refer me to? Where should I go? That man says, I only know one true scholar who has not changed Christianity, who's honest and you can trust him. He's in a place called Nusaybin, it's in the Mardin province of Turkey, modern day Turkey. Go there, learn from him. Salman travels again to learn from that man. Now look, this is not easy keep for him to keep migrating. Look at the sacrifice that he's willing for the sake of his religion and faith. So he goes to Nusaybin in modern day Turkey and he meets this man. He was only one of few who had remained a true Christian at the time. So he meets this man, the same scenario happens. Before this man passes away, he refers him to another person in Amuria, which is Amorium. Um, it was a city that was founded in the Hellenistic period and today it's in Turkey. So he learned, he learns Christianity from him, he deepens his religious sciences. Now something different happens this time. When this man in Amuria is about to die, Salman asks him the same question, where should I go? He tells him honestly, I no longer know any true Christian scholar who's on the path of Isa salam. I don't know anyone in the world today. But I'll tell you something, in our scriptures we've read signs about the final prophet. I see that the signs are emerging and he will emerge in Arabia. The description that he gives him is the city of Medina in a place that has a lot of palm trees, he gives him the descriptions. Stop searching for Christian scholars, go and find that prophet. Make it a priority in your life to find that final prophet. Salman asks him, okay does he have any signs? I mean how am I going to find him out of all those people? What if somebody falsely claims that he's a prophet? He tells him, no I'll give you some signs that's are, that are written in our Christian scriptures. First of all, this prophet does not accept sadaqah. If you offer him charity, he'll reject it. That's one sign. The second sign he'll accept gifts. If you give him hadiyah, if you give him a gift, he'll accept it. Thirdly, there's a seal on his shoulder. It's called Khatam in Nubuwa. It's a seal of prophethood. You'll see this inscribed on his shoulder. If you see that and you see these signs, this is the prophet. Salman now, his only goal in life is to get himself to Arabia. He's now decided to migrate to Arabia for the first time, he's never been there. He meets a caravan from Bani Kalab who were going south from that Turkey area to Arabia. He tells them, can I go with you? I want to go to Arabia, take me with you. So he makes a deal with them and they say, okay, we'll take you with us. What do they do? 
They betray Salman, they claim that he is their slave, they own him, and they sell him to a Jewish man in, the, in Northern Arabia. They get to a village, they go to a wealthy Jewish man, hey, we have a slave here, want to buy him? Tell them, I'm not a slave, but you have a whole caravan against you. How are you going to prove that you're free? Salman is very disappointed. He's on his way to meet the Prophet. He's so anxious, looking for the last messenger. And now this predicament, this obstacle in the way. So that Jewish man had a lot of farmlands. He buys him and he puts him to hard work. And Salman was a hard worker. He's patient. Even if a tragedy happens on your path to Allah, don't give up. In fact, sometimes Allah, when you really want to go to His path, He might put an obstacle. It's a test to see your faith, to see if you really are motivated and you'll continue. Salman was very hardworking. One day, the cousin of this Jewish man from the tribe of Banu Qurayza visits his cousin who owned Salman. And he saw Salman working on the field. He told his cousin, you have an excellent slave and laborer here. Can I buy him from you? I could use him. So his friend said, okay, you're my cousin and you want to buy him, I'll sell him to you. When Salman hears that this Jewish man, the cousin, is from Bani Qurayza, where did Bani Qurayza live at the time? Medina. Around Medina, in and around the city of Medina. And there's a lot of farmlands and a lot of palm trees. That's one sign that he was looking for. An area in Arabia, because Arabia is desert. You don't find palm trees. But Medina at the time had palm trees. He becomes ecstatic. He says, that's one step closer to meeting that prophet and seeing if he has emerged. So he's really happy when he's sold the second time. The first time he wasn't happy, but the second time he was really happy. He's like, Bani Qurayla are in and around Medina, so I'm getting closer. So basically his cousin buys him and he takes him to the city of Medina. One day, while he was working on the field, on the farm, he was on a palm tree, I think maybe gathering dates or whatever. He was working when he hears his Jewish master talking to some of his friends. He tells some of his friends, have you heard there is a man in Quba who just arrived and he's claiming to be the final prophet and his name is Muhammad. Sallallahu alayhi wa Allahumma salli ala Muhammad wa When Salman heard this, he froze. A man in Quba claiming to be the Prophet. He's been waiting for ages to meet this man. And so the, you know, excitement, the eagerness, even the anxiety is building up in the heart of Salman. He quickly comes down from the palm tree. He tells his master, what did you say? What's that news? He tells him, be quiet, it's none of your business, go back on the field. He didn't want him to hear. But Salman, he, he, he could not hold still, hearing that someone has just arrived Quba. So Salman, what he does in the middle of the night, he flees Medina and the farmlands of his master, and he goes south to Quba. Remember, Quba is not far from Medina. If you walk pretty fast or run, you can get there in a couple of hours. It's what, three, four miles? even less, right? If you run maybe in 30 minutes, an hour, you can get there. So at night, he goes to Quba. The next day, he comes to meet the Prophet but at this time, he doesn't know if this man is really a Prophet, it's just a claim. He sees him sitting with his companions. He's like, let me use those signs that that Christian scholar shared with me. So he brought some dates with him from the farmland. He comes and he greets the Prophet and the companions and he tells the Prophet I've heard you're a righteous man and you have good companions, so I've brought some sadaqah, some charity. Here, take it. The Prophet takes it, Salman notices that he gives it to his companions, he tells them eat, but he himself does not take a single piece of date. Salman is keenly observing, so he tells himself, that's one. One sign, one down, two to go. He has that sign. And that 
excitement is just building up in the heart of Salman. He goes back to Medina before his master discovers he's fled and he's met the Prophet. He goes back to Medina. The Prophet, a few days after spending time in Quba, where does he go? Medina itself. So when the Prophet now is in Medina, this is in the first year of the Hijrah. The Prophet is in Medina, the Prophet had just come. Salman goes and brings another plate of dates. He greets the Prophet and the companions. This time Salman says, you know, I still think you're a righteous man and I would like to give you a gift to you and your companions. When he says the word gift, he sees the Prophet thanked him and he took a date. The Prophet ate some of those dates. He's like, that's the second sign that that Christian scholar told me. Now he's waiting for the third sign. But that third sign is where? On the shoulder of the Prophet. How is he going to uncover? Like if he goes to the Prophet and removes his shirt, Maybe the companions think this guy is uh, here to assassinate him. He, you know, he was waiting for the right moment. So one day, when one of the companions of the Prophet died, the Prophet went to the Baqi, the cemetery right by his mosque, to do the burial and to walk in his janazah and funeral. He went behind the Prophet. And he was, you know, trying to see if maybe the garment that the Prophet was wearing in the funeral, maybe sometimes it's pushed to the side a little bit because remember at the time one common um, garment that the Arabs would wear is like the ihram. You've seen men in ihram, I mean sometimes if you're moving around your shoulder can easily be uncovered. So he went behind the Prophet to see if he can see that seal. The Prophet he notices Salman behind him trying to look for the seal. So the Prophet deliberately pushes the garment a little bit to the side so that his shoulder is uncovered. Salman comes and he sees the seal. The minute he seals the seal, he falls at the feet of Rasulullah And he tells him, I've been searching for you all this time and now I have found you and you are the Prophet and ashhadu an la ilaha illallah wa ashhadu anna muhammadar rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa According to historians, this happened in Jamadi, Jamadi al-Awwal. Now the Prophet came to Medina in which month? Rabi'ah. So we're talking about two, three months after the Prophet came in Medina, Salman became a Muslim. But now there was one challenge. He becomes a Muslim, but there's a Jewish man who what? Owns him. And in fact, the Jewish man had a deal with Salman that if you plant 300 palm trees for me, and you give me 40 awqiya of gold, an amount of gold, then you could buy your freedom, I could release you. Now Salman was broke, he didn't have anything. So he informs the Prophet The Prophet tells him we'll take care of it. Ask for the 300 palm trees that you have to plant. I'm going to ask my companions to help you in planting 300 palm trees. Go prepare the land that you have to plant those palm trees, you know, dig, uh, make the land ready so that we plant the seed and then call me. So Salman called on the Prophet, he said, Ya Rasulullah, the earth is now ready. There's like 300 little holes where we're gonna put the seeds. The Prophet himself comes, he takes the seeds and he plants those 300 palm trees. Salman by the way comments later, he says those 300 trees that the Prophet plants, not one of them decayed, not one of them one year did it not give fruits and, and dates. It was the barakah of the hand of the Prophet When that happens and the Prophet gathers the money, the gold that he had to give, he writes a document for the Jewish man to serve as testimony and he has Imam Ali salam write the document. The document states that Salman has earned his freedom, he's planted 300 palm trees, he's given 40 amount of whatever awqiya of gold and this is proof that he no longer belongs to the Jewish man and now he belongs to Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi. The Prophet secures his freedom then he frees Salman. Yes, sister. I was just wondering, how, did, how does that seal come about? Is that from God, the seal? Yes, the Prophet was actually born with that seal. If you remember from last year, um, Bahira or Buhaira, that monk, 
He actually saw the seal when the Prophet was with his grandfather Abdul Muttalib or Abu Talib it was on his way to Sham. He actually saw that mark of prophethood and this was written in the Jewish and Christian scriptures that the final prophet has a mark on his shoulder and that mark is a unique mark that nobody had seen anything like. There are some ahadith that describe exactly what that mark is. Um, as we progress in this class, when we talk about the physical features of the Prophet, we'll, we will talk about that inshallah. But it was something that was actually like engraved on the shoulder of the Prophet. I don't want to use the word tattoo, but you get the idea, right? Like, like well, there's something that's permanent. Something that's permanent. It wasn't a birthmark because it was a seal of prophethood. It was actually um, a specific type of seal. It wasn't just like a birthmark. But you could compare it to a birthmark. It was a specific type of birthmark. Something that was unique that no human being in history had the like of. That even when someone would see it, it was very profound. Those who had read about it in their scriptures, the minute they saw it, they recognized it. 